Hello everyone, Helen here. Welcome along, welcome into the camper van and I'm going to take you today off to Scotland to the on the second part of Phil and I's a recent trip that we went on. Uh, thank you to everybody who expressed their enjoyment of the first part. It was really lovely, um, especially uh, some of you who saw places that we went to that were familiar to you and maybe you'd even lived there or been on holiday there and some of you had ancestors from the area. Oh, it was lovely. I really love hearing these little snippets of information, uh, get to know you a little bit. Uh, so that was that was really lovely. And yeah, and following on from last week when I was talking to you about, oh, I don't know, should I keep the camper van videos properly separate in a separate channel? And the the overwhelming uh, response that I got was, was no, that lots of you love having the mixture of things that, that I share. And so sometimes it's crafting and sometimes it's camper vanning and other things and uh, sometimes they cross over. So yeah, I, I think I feel most comfortable with just sticking with one channel and just, you never know what you're gonna get each week when you when you come to watch. Um, so, uh, I, and it's so lovely. I'm absolutely overwhelmed with the number of new viewers that I've had recently and that my subscriber number has gone over what three thousand. I mean, I was I was really amazed when it went got to a thousand, and I never imagined getting to this many because I'm not I'm not here on YouTube for trying to get thousands and thousands of viewers. I'm just sharing with a few few people who like to pop in uh, and like to hear about what I've been up to and what I've been making and all that kind of thing. So. Thank you to absolutely everybody who has subscribed. And, uh, you know, some of you have been here right from the beginning, which was over three years ago. And I just had a, a few really real kind of regular stalwart viewers who would comment every week. And, and that was lovely. But it's it's so nice to welcome lots of new people as well. Thank you for telling me that you're new and um, it, it's it's really just been amazing. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to stop rambling on about that now and take you on the second part of our trip to Scotland. So in the first part, we travelled from where we live in Durham uh, towards Oban and we paused overnight just south of the border near Carlisle. And after exploring the village of Brough by Sands, we stopped off at Gretna Green and at Helensborough and Inverary and the Crinan Canal and some standing stones. And when I left you last time, we just checked in for our ferry uh, for the Isle of Col. And you can see the route that we were going to take on this map here. For the first time in our experience of Carmack ferries, we didn't actually leave on time, but we departed half an hour late. I'm not sure what the hold up was. Anyway, it always feels like an exciting moment driving onto a ferry, especially when you're going to somewhere you've never been before. And after being directed into our place on the car deck, we made our way to the cafe and ordered breakfast. We both had a very nice bacon and black pudding roll with a cup of tea. Well, we spent much of the remainder of the two and three quarter hour journey out on the deck. We were fortunate that the rain had disappeared, at least for a while. There was plenty to see as we passed between the Isle of Mull and the mainland, which was quite a long stretch of the journey, until eventually we were away from the land and heading for Col. Most of the time I sat outside knitting, knitting my shawl, the wings of a dove shawl. I don't know why, but it is just so satisfying sitting there with your hands occupied while you're travelling along in the open, surrounded by the sea and some beautiful Scottish scenery. It was a very calm crossing and as we breathed in the sea air and watched the world go by, we definitely started to relax.
place is perhaps even more exciting than when you first board the ferry. Those first tantalising glimpses of an unexplored island. Well, unexplored by us at least, and wondering what we'll find. The ferry often seems to take an age to pull into the dock. On this occasion, the ferry had to swing right round before it could edge its way into position. Before long, we were driving off the ferry and onto the Isle of Col. It was mid-morning when we arrived. We drove past some little whitewashed cottages and very soon came to the largest settlement on the island, Arinagar. And apologies if that's not the right pronunciation. I'm not really sure how you meant to say it. Anyway, it was here that we would be staying for our first night on Col. We checked into the community centre and we were directed to our pre-booked place in a little parking area set aside for a small number of camper vans, which was next to the bunkhouse. And it's next to the community centre as well, where the bathroom facilities are open all hours. We didn't stay there for long right then, but instead we headed off along one of Cole's two main roads, roughly going south. The island's only about 13 miles or 21 kilometres long by three miles wide. That's about five kilometres. And this drive was typical of our experience on Col. The roads are mostly inland rather than following the coastline, uh, so that a lot of the time it's hard to imagine that you're on an island. parked in a large grassy area next to a massive bank of sand dunes and settled down to do a good bit of relaxing. Col is a brilliant place to go if you simply want to get away from everything. There are no big visitor attractions or shopping places, just an RSPB bird reserve, lots of nature and lots of little hidden beaches. And that's about it. <laughs> We purposely chose to come here first so that we could just switch off from the outside world and not feel obliged to rush around visiting one place of interest after another. After lunch in the van and a couple of hours of relaxing, so we were reading or knitting and uh, things, and we decided to go out for a little walk, which turned into rather a longer walk than we'd intended. <laughs> we walked across the Macher an area of special floral grassland that hosts many wild flowers. It's a type of grassland that's unique to the west of Scotland and to parts of Western Ireland as well, and home to some of the rarest plants and animals in, in Britain. We were heading for Feel Beach, which can only be reached by foot, and it wasn't surprising that when we got there, uh, the place was deserted.
As we turned back to return to the van, our way was barred by a large herd of cows and calves. And rather than walk through them, you may already know that I'm a little afraid of having close encounters with cows. I didn't even take a photo or video of them. Uh, so we decided to take a detour via the sand dunes. This was a good and a bad idea. Good because it was amazing to be climbing up onto an impressively large area of sand dunes with views to the distant sea and it felt very adventurous. But it was also bad because it actually took us a lot longer than we expected and was rather tiring for my little legs, wading through tall spiky grasses and having to do a lot of ups and downs as well as being constantly buffeted by the strong winds. I was so relieved to get back to the van and drive back to our overnight spot by Arinagawa Community Centre. We decided to cook a simple tea in the van of pasta with a ready-made tomato and mascarpone sauce, supplemented by onions that we softened first in the pan before stirring in the sauce and pasta, and then topped it with some grated parmesan cheese. I was up very early the next morning to go for a shower in the community centre. It was an excellent shower, clean and warm, and it cost two pounds for a luxurious six minutes. We slowly got ready for the day and hanging up our damp towels to dry using some very strong magnets to secure them. This was an excellent tip from a camper van channel that I love to watch called Life is Too Short. I don't know what we did before we had these magnets, they are proving to be very useful indeed. We also use them for airing bedding when it gets a bit clammy and for hanging up damp tea towels. We had a few housekeeping tasks to do, such as emptying the grey tank, which just contains dirty water from washing dishes and such like. But it needs to be emptied into specific locations so as not to harm the environment. Uh, we also filled the freshwater tank with water. We have uh, quite a large capacity for water in our van, but we always take the opportunity to fill up when we can. We drove the short distance into Arinagar village to drop off some recycling and to go to the shop. I was amused to see all the sheep waiting outside. <laughs> the shop was well stocked with basic goods and as we were going off into the wilds for the next couple of days, we needed a few provisions. As we headed out of the village, we were surprised to see a huge truck blocking our way. A truck that actually transforms into an 80-seat cinema in which was visiting the island for a couple of days. What a brilliant idea and what a special treat for the residents and visitors, although we didn't take advantage of it. Once the road had cleared, we turned off the road that we'd taken the previous day, taking us into new territory. As with all of the Scottish islands that we visited, the vast majority of the roads are single track, with passing places to be used when traffic is coming the other way. The roads on Col were quite lumpy and often had grass growing along the middle, but well, that just made it feel all the more adventurous. We were driving towards the west on this particular morning and after parking the van, we set off on a little walk to Ho Beach. <music>
it started raining just as we were arriving back at the van. And it actually didn't stop raining until the following morning. As the rain got heavier and heavier and the winds stronger and stronger, we drove northwards up the only other road on the island that we hadn't been on. We found a place just off the road and spent most of the afternoon there. We had some lunch of scotch eggs and salad, then hunkered down, feeling very cosy and enjoying the wind and rain lashing the outside of the van. Phil settled into some reading and I worked on a couple of knitting projects. The, the beginning of a jumper for the orangutan and the light candy cowl. And you can see what I mean when I said in a previous podcast that my videos are not always in chronological order because both of these projects have long since been completed. We then drove a short way along the road uh, to find our pre-booked overnight wild camping spot at a place called Torriston Farm. We were nowhere near the actual farm, uh, so there were no facilities, but we were very happy with our isolated location. There was no one else camping anywhere near us, and we even had a bit of a view of the sea. Col discourages people from overnighting wherever they choose, mainly out of concern for protecting their environment, but they offer places that can be booked in advance, and we were very happy about this system. We made a bacon and courgette risotto for our tea. We were nowhere near Arinagawa, which is the only place where you can eat out. And the risotto was very tasty. We followed this with homemade apple pie. I'd found a recipe for making apple pie in the Ridge Monkey and I was really keen to try it out. the next morning the rain had started to ease so we took a walk down to the nearby beach. 
it was really windy and so that's why I'm not including much in the way of sea sounds. Uh, I don't have any protection for my microphone. But we thoroughly enjoyed another deserted beach, as did the two knitted pigs, Matthew and Rose, who'd hitched a lift in my bag as we made our way to the beach. And a little later we spotted them amongst the rocks, enjoying their honeymoon in this remote spot. I've shown you these honeymoon photos before, but I've included them here so that they have some context. I really felt like a child again, playing with my cuddly toys and imagining the whispered conversations between the two pigs as I took photos of them enjoying the beach. We left our overnight spot, driving carefully down over the grassy, fairly bumpy sand dunes and back onto the road and then we drove as far as we could in a northerly direction, although disappointingly the road didn't lead to anywhere that we could park and go for a walk, so we had to just turn around and, and go back the way we'd come. So we returned to Arunagar and had a lovely wander through the village and we spotted these amazing seats that presumably were made from uprooted trees. What a great way to let them live on. I wonder if they were washed up on the beach because there are actually very few trees on the island itself. It was very peaceful in the village. Col has a small population of about 200 people and there were very few people about while we were there. In fact, I think we saw more activity from the local sheep than any human activity. <laughs> it made us chuckle to watch this sheep having a really good scratch while his mates headed up off the road, although he did eventually decide to move on and join his friends. By then it was early afternoon and we were getting a bit hungry. The cafe in the village closes on Sundays, Mondays and Tuesdays, which was the exact days that we were there, so we headed instead for the Col Hotel which is the island's only pub and restaurant and hotel as well. It's been there since 1963 and it's still run by the same family. And much of the food that it serves is from Col or from neighbouring islands. Its attractive location means that it has beautiful views across the bay and inside the decor is very tasteful, somehow modern and traditional all at the same time. The service was really quick, and we thoroughly enjoyed our meals. Phil had a goat's cheese salad and I had a grilled halloumi burger, followed by an extremely delicious chocolate dessert. We relaxed by the seafront where it was warm enough to have the van door open, well at least until the sun came out and then we were visited by some over-friendly midges. <laughs> Before long though it was time to drive the short distance to the ferry terminal ready for our journey to the nearby island of Tyree. We waited for our turn to board, though when it came to our turn, Phil was asked to reverse onto the ferry. I'm not really sure why, and it's not something we've ever been asked to do before. 
Fortunately, he's a confident driver, though it did feel a little worrying on the fairly narrow link between the shore and ferry. However, we were soon in position and the ferry prepared to depart. This crossing from Col to Tyree only took about an hour and the sea was fairly calm. You can see on the map here where we were heading, just a short hop from one small island to the next. As Col faded into the distance, we started wondering how Tyree would compare. And yet again, I felt as though we were on a proper adventure, discovering new and exciting places. Before long, we glimpsed our first sighting of Tyree, and gradually we got closer, and soon we were watching the crew preparing for our arrival at Scaranish on Tyree. And as it turned out, Tyree couldn't have been more different to Col. But I'm going to save that for the next part of our trip. And that is where I'm going to finish today. And this this trip to Scotland will continue on uh, uh, next, well, not next week, but probably uh, the week after that. Uh, and we'll be on the Isle of Tyree. So until then, take good care of yourself. Keep nice and busy. And I will see you again very soon. Bye.